Once again, how are you? Good? I think you all need to get your wiggles out this morning. Can we roll that video? Just kidding. All right? Hey, but it is, um, so Super Bowl Sunday today. Now, you may not be into football at all, those of you online, but I'm, I pretty much guarantee you're all into snacks. And so, you know, whether or not you, you, you love to watch the game. So I want to give you just one second because I think you got to get loose a little bit. Those of you online, you can type it in. If you were going to have any snack that you wanted to have, it can be your guilty pleasure even, all right? So don't like think like, well, I can only have, you know, carrots, right? And some of you may love carrots, and that's okay. But anything you want to, to watch the game today, go ahead. You have permission to talk to your neighbor here real quick. Um, what would you have if you could have any snack that you wanted to have? Those of you type it online. Go ahead. Ready? You got like 15 seconds. Ready? Go. I'm, I'm counting on you, Tony. What is it? <laughs> Tony loves circus peanuts. Like, you get anything in the world. It's like chicken wings, like circus peanuts. I'm not going to Tony's house for Super Bowl Sunday. All right. Here's some circus peanuts. Uh -huh. All right, well, hey, hopefully, uh, hopefully you're having something fun today. You get to enjoy the afternoon together. Like, for me, it's pretty much anything. Like, I'll do, I'll do all of it. And so it'll be a fun day together, and hopefully you get to enjoy some time. Hey, we're going to continue in our uh, Lord's Prayer series. We're in week six, so I encourage you, if you've got a Bible, grab it. Uh, if you don't have the scripture, you know, maybe you have it on your phone or it'll be on the screen. We're going to be all over the place again today uh, in the scriptures. I think God's got an important word for us. But before we do, um, let's go ahead and just jump into reading the Lord's Prayer together. Hopefully you have it by heart by now, but we'll have it on the screen if you do not. Ready? And here we go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we do this prayer series a couple times a year because, uh, and we're coming to the conclusion, so we've got one more week. Um, but we do it because we believe that prayer changes things, right? And not only does prayer change things, prayer changes me. And when we join together in praying together, and hopefully you've experienced this over the last several weeks, that prayer changes us. Right, prayer changes us as the community of faith, as the body of Christ. As we pray together, as we join in this journey together, the Spirit begins to work collectively on us. And prayer puts us in a position to hear from God. It puts us in a position to, we talked about this last week, listen and obey. It's one thing to hear from God. It's a whole other thing to actually do what God would have us to do. Right? And so we love to hear from God, but sometimes we don't like to obey what God would have us do. But this is how God works. We listen and we obey. And because of that, prayer has the power to shape your life. Prayer has the power to, to shape your life into the way of Jesus and the way of the kingdom of God. And I'm trusting that as we've journeyed together in prayer these last six weeks, that you've begun to notice how God is beginning to shape you. And maybe as you've prayed at 9 and at noon and at 6 p.m. as you've joined us together, that, that somehow by God's Spirit your life is beginning to look a little more like Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is, is shaping you into the way of the kingdom. You see, the Lord's Prayer is a gift. And it's a gift for a framework for the kind of prayer that specifically shapes us in the way of the kingdom of God in our present reality. So this is important, right? So it's your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's in our present reality. Like the reality of competing kingdoms and competing wills. The reality of our humanness and our frailty, of our brokenness and our dependency. The kingdom of God comes alive in the midst of these right now realities. Right? And these realities begin to shape our life and our life together. And one of the most profound realities of our humanness is our wandering hearts. So I grew up in, in church and uh, back in the day when you went to church in the morning on Sunday and you went to church at night on Sunday and then you came back on Wednesday and went to church again. Anybody, anybody say amen, right? Some of you were around in those days, right? And my dad, I was a pastor and so I was there oftentimes more than that. And uh, when we first started our, the church up in the mountains, my great-grandmother used to drive 45 miles, right? My great-grandmother um, would drive 45 miles to come in and play the piano every 
Sunday. Um, so from Fresno up into the mountains. And, uh, and so she would come in and play the piano and we used to sing some hymns. And, uh, and so I have a lot of hymns kind of back in my, in my memory. And one of those is a hymn called Come Thou Fount. Anybody remember? Right? Come thou fount of many... Right? We know this, okay? Right? So there's a verse here that says, it says, Oh to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter. So sometimes uh, like hymns use weird words that we don't use. So fetter, right? It's a, it's a bind. Right? Let thy goodness like a fetter. Bind my wandering heart to thee. And then there's this phrase that, that rings in my mind. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Anybody feel that, right? There's this, there's this tension that kind of goes on in our hearts and our lives that I want this, but I know that God wants this. And, and why do I battle with this back and forth? Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7. Like, why do I want the things I know that I shouldn't want? Why do I do the things that I know that I shouldn't do? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. See, it's our daily reality. Our daily reality. And so we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we pray this because victory is possible. Right? You are, we, are not, we are not kind of just at the whim of sin in our lives that even though you're prone to wander, even though you're prone to these things, we're not necessarily subject to them. We have a leader and we have a deliverer, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So this morning I want to take kind of a simple approach. And I want to answer a few questions about this, about this little section of the Lord's Prayer that might come up for you as, you, as we think about this. They, they come up for me and they might come up for you as you think about it. And then give you some tools um, when it comes to trials and temptations that we will, capital W-I-L-L, that we will face. Because here's the truth. If it, it's not if you face trials, right? It's not if you will encounter temptation, but when. Right? When you face trials and when you face and when you encounter temptation. This word temptation is actually translated um, probably better as trial or test. It's a, it's a word that gets used interchangeably all throughout, especially the New Testament scriptures in the original language. And, uh, but, but this leads us to this idea of, of this first question when praying the Lord's Prayer. If you were to sit down and think about this, is this. How does God or does God lead us into temptation? Right, so we just prayed, lead us not into temptation. And one of the first things we do when we're, when we're faced with scriptures, the first things that maybe you should do when you're faced with questions in the scriptures is to look to other examples in scripture, right? For clarity around something or primarily to, primarily to look to the life of Jesus for clarity around questions that we might have. Does God actually lead us into temptation? So the first thing in my mind is, was Jesus tempted? And so if, if everything Jesus experienced is similar to our life experience, do we ask the question, was Jesus tempted? Well, the answer is yes, right? If you know the scriptures, we can rewind a little bit. So if you go back to Matthew chapter 4, we find Jesus, he was baptized. And right after his baptism, he goes into the desert for 40 days where he's fasting. And he is tempted in the desert. He goes toe-to-toe with Satan. And there in the desert, Satan tempts Jesus with what the Apostle John will call in, in one of his letters a little bit later in the scriptures, the lust of the flesh. Right? So, he, so Satan says, turn these rocks into bread. Like satisfy yourself, Jesus. And then he says, the lust of the eyes. Jesus, look at all the kingdoms of this world. I can give this to you. I can, I, can, I can give all this to you and people will, will bow down and worship you because they have to, right? Or the pride of life. And Satan tempts him with power. Jesus, throw yourself down from the temple here and your angels will come around and, and pick you up. Like demonstrate your power, demonstrate your, your authority. But Jesus refuses all of that. But, and I don't want to get into that so much this morning, but, but I want us to look back at how this journey begins with Jesus. So if you looked at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. Then Jesus, right after he was baptized, was led by the Spirit. Okay, so he was led by the Spirit into the, de- into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he's led by the Spirit. It would seem, perhaps, that God leads us into places where our faith or our allegiance might be tested. And the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into this space. And yet in this space, it's not God. It's not the Father that attempts to, to throw Jesus off his game. 
Right? Jesus is tempted by the devil. Right here in just this one verse, we see both a situation of being led into a season of testing and being tempted by the evil one. And we also see, if we were to read this whole passage, right, that, that we see that Jesus already has everything that he needs to not only pass the test, but to withstand temptation. See, Jesus didn't have to try because he was trained. Jesus didn't have to try to resist temptation because he was trained against temptation. We're going to talk about this a little bit more at the end. But where God leads, God also delivers. And this is the lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Where God leads, God also delivers. James, the brother of Jesus, uh, he writes this short, highly practical letter called James, right, towards the end of your New Testament scriptures. And he unpacks this idea a little bit for us. This is what he says. He says, consider it pure joy, right? This is not necessarily what we consider trials and temptations. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Again, not my, not my first, like, man, I just love this, right? These trials are amazing. This is not, but just understand what James says, right? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So that you can be trained, right? So that, so that you can be fit for the day of trial, fit for the day of temptation. And we skip down to verse 13. He says this, when tempted, not if, right? When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Here it is. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So there's the answer to our question. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by what? Their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. You see, James makes it very clear that God does not tempt us with sin. We do well enough with that on our own. Any amens out there, right? But, but God in his grace uses difficult situations to help us grow in spiritual maturity. And it's often in those difficult situations, as we saw with Jesus, that Satan, the evil one, presents temptation. Right? In these seasons of trial, in these seasons of maybe testing when things aren't going well, that oftentimes we're, we face temptation in those things. And when temptation becomes often most alluring. But temptation and trial are not the same thing. Trials are an opportunity for growth. Right? Temptations are an opportunity for sin. Let's not get the two confused. Right? Trials are opportunities for you to grow. Temptation is opportunity for sin. And this, this leads us to, to our second question here. And this one often weirds people out. So if it weirds you out a little bit today, just know that it's okay. It weirds me out too. Um, but, but it's the reality that we have to deal with. And it's the reality of the evil one. Right? Or, or whom the scriptures often call the Satan, right? Or the devil. And as in our prayer, the evil one. Some of your translations might just say, and deliver us from evil. But an actual more accurate translation is evil one. We don't have to go into the, the Greek there. Um, but it's specifically saying there is, there is this reality of an evil one. So can we be tempted by Satan? is the question that we have to wrestle with. Or is there an evil being out there like trying to, to get me, right? I don't, I don't think anyone would argue that evil exists. I mean, even if we just look around, right, and, and see our world around us, or our history, right, no one's going to argue that evil doesn't exist. But is there a source behind that evil that is working to thwart the goodness of God? Yes. Right? There's, a, there's a source behind that evil that's working to thwart God's goodness and God's redemptive purposes for humanity in general. And all we have to do is look at the scriptures again and to the life of Jesus to see this. So, so back to the temptation of Christ in the desert. Right? Just within this encounter with Jesus, we see three names used for the reality of a being whose sole purpose is, is to disrupt the redemptive plan of God initiated in Christ. So in verse 3, he's called the tempter. In verse 5, it's called the devil. In verse 10, it's Satan. Right? In verse 11, it says this, then the devil left him. Right? So if the devil isn't real, then who left? Right? So if Satan isn't, isn't real, then, then who left Jesus? And so it makes it really clear for us right, that the devil left him and the angels came and attended Jesus. This account shows us the reality that evil has a personification. And as strange and as unsettling as this is, Satan is working in the world to disrupt God's redemptive plan through a whole host of systems and structures. Right, but the devil is not everywhere. 
So you got to know this, right? I want to encourage us not to go to extremes here that at some times and in some spaces, people treat the devil like the devil has the same power as God. Like they're kind of like matched up in this thing and they're not even close, right? There is not a demon under every rock. There is not a demon hiding in, in every bush, right? Or secretly sending coded messages to you through 80s heavy metal, right? Any church children, right? Grow up in the 80s and 90s, right? Where we were taught that if you just played the music backwards, like there was some secret encoded message from the devil for you. Some of you are like, what? Yeah, welcome to my childhood, Right? This, this is not, this is not Satan. This is not what the evil one does, right? So, so we don't want to go to extremes here. But listen, listen to what Peter, what Jesus says to Peter right before the Last Supper. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as we, all the disciples. Right, so there's something, there's a spiritual battle going on, this reality of the evil one. But Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Strengthen your brothers. This is another one of those passages that kind of stops you in your tracks if you think about it. Like, wait, what? Like Satan is asking to sift the disciples as wheat, whatever that means, right? Like he's asking, he's asking to have them, right? To, to cast them out. And can you imagine hearing this from Jesus if you were one of his disciples? Like you just had a good supper together and, and Jesus is talking about crucifixion and everything. You're like, yeah, you know. And then, it, then he stands Peter up and he's like, hey, Peter. Satan has asked to sift you and the disciples as wheat. But hang on, I've, I've prayed for you. You see, clearly Jesus has this understanding that Satan is real, right? And that, that, that Satan is at work. And if we're going to follow Jesus, we should not be ignorant of this reality. But I want you to see two quick important things here in Jesus' statement to Peter. And the first one is this, Satan asked, right? Did you, did you see that? Like says, Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you. See, Satan has no power except what is given to him by God. He has nothing, no power, no authority except what is already given to him. And this is another great mystery, but it should bring us great comfort that our father, as we pray, is not in danger of being overthrown. Right? There is no power that anybody has except what is granted to them by our father. Right? So we should not be afraid. I love what uh, author and pastor and theologian Tony Evans says here. He says, Satan may be able to knock you down. He has more power than you, but he has absolutely no authority over you if you're a believer. There's a difference between power and authority. Right? Satan has no power. He has no power except what is given to him by God. He has no authority over you. And this leads us to the second one, that we don't have to be afraid because Jesus prays for us. See, Peter gets knocked down. Right, shortly after this, all the disciples abandon Jesus, right? They do. They, they go everywhere. And, uh, and Peter denies Jesus three times. And yet, even in Peter's failure, when it seemed like the devil had won, when it seemed like Satan had exercised authority over them, that God had the power to restore and God does, right? So if you remember, when we pray our Father, right, we recognize who has all the authority, right? Hallowed be your name, our Father in heaven, if we look over at Romans chapter 8, and we've actually got a class happening on Romans right now, and they've been living in chapter 8. So if you're interested in that, it happens right after service uh, online on Zoom. And uh, they're diving in. I think they're almost like right here on this verse right now. But this is Paul, and he says this, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. That Jesus is praying for you in your trials in your temptations, you have a deliverer, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So to summarize here, like God does not tempt us with sin, but God allows trials and God allows testing to serve as an opportunity for our faith to be strengthened. You remember after Peter's test, Jesus tells him, hey, after, after you have turned back, strengthen the other believers. Right? That these trials and these, sometimes these temptations that we face can serve to strengthen us right, for the task ahead. So God does not tempt us with sin, but Satan is real. And Satan uses the circumstances and the systems and the structures of this world to tempt those who have given their allegiance to Jesus. And it's often in the midst of these trials when these temptations are most prevalent. And we find this, again, throughout the scriptures, we find this reality. Paul, again, writes this famous passage of scripture to the church in Ephesus. He says this in Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. So there it is again. 
For our struggle, here it is, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so Jesus, he instructs his followers to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There is this reality out there that that we are in some ways at risk, that we're going to face trial, we're going to face Uh, testing and we are in need of deliverance when it comes to the evil one when it comes to temptation and we've asked a couple of questions here about the text and and now I just want to take a couple of minutes um, to to help us understand some realizations and then some application right so realizations about temptation and trial and then something that you can walk away with today and at first we've already hinted at this but it says and lead us not into temptation See, for those who have confessed faith in Jesus Christ and have given allegiance to his kingdom, we have a leader, right? You are being led. If you've given your allegiance to Jesus Christ, you are being led. You have a leader. And there is great comfort here as we experience seasons of trial, as we experience seasons of of testing, when we wrestle with temptation. See, Psalm 23, right? We have a good shepherd, who leads us beside still waters, right? But he also leads us somewhere else through the valley of the shadow of death. Right? So sometimes these places that the good shepherd leads us aren't the most fun, but the task of the good shepherd is to give us life, right? That we can trust where we are being led. This is what allegiance means, that I will follow where you lead me. Jesus helps us understand this in John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief, the devil, Satan, another word that they use, right, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus has come that they may have life, that you may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, Jesus shows us the motivation, right, of the thief, of Satan, and that's to steal to kill and destroy, right? This is what temptation is designed to do in your life. So you remember that if you think back to that last section of James, right? And James says, when sin, when when you give in to temptation and it turns into sin, when that sin is full grown, it gives birth to death, right? And this is what what the evil one, this is what temptation is designed to do, to produce death in you. Some of you have experienced this, but Jesus, right? Jesus shows us that his motivation, the good shepherd is to give us life, And life, not only just like life that's okay, but life to the full, life abundantly, life everlasting. So there's a moment of truth here. See, it's difficult to pray this prayer with any sort of sincerity, with any sort of integrity, if you're unwilling to be led. For us to say, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. God, I'm I'm facing difficult situation. I need you to deliver me, but I'm unwilling to be led by you. You think think the prayer is going to work if you're unwilling to be led? If you're unwilling to follow where Jesus leads you? we're We're just lying to ourselves at that point. See, it might be wise to consider if you're struggling with temptation, who is actually leading your life? If you, if you keep falling into temptation, are you allowing yourself to be led? Because we have a deliverer. And this is the second realization, is that those who pray this prayer need deliverance. We need to be delivered. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Right? It's the evil one who leads us into temptation. As we mentioned earlier, though Satan has no authority, but Satan does have power. And it's easy to forget that. And when I pray this, I pray in humility, realizing and recognizing that I need to be delivered. The scriptures talk so much about pride, right? Because it's pride that makes us think we got this. Right? Have you ever been in a situation where you thought in your mind, I got this? But then you quickly realize, like, I don't got this. <laughs> right? Like, ah, uh, nope. Like, I thought I, I thought I had this and I stepped into this situation and I don't have this. So snowed like two weeks ago, right? And I love it when it snows here. I wish, it, I wish we got feet of snow, but that's just me. I know some of you got it. You're crazy. Uh, but my son and I were outside and we're, the snow was really wet, right? And so we're rolling, we're rolling snowballs and I'm rolling them so big we can hardly move them. And we got the first one down of our weird looking, I call it a snow bear, right? A snow bear here. And then uh, and I'm like, let's make this thing huge. I want it at least taller than me. And so we get the big, big one down and then we start rolling the second one. And I'm like, okay, that's probably big enough. And then we're like, and I'm like, oh, we got this. 
I can lift this thing, right? And so, like, I get into this thing, right? Like, I'm like some sumo dude, right? And, and I'm, I'm like, I get this thing up, and I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble, all right? And so I've got it up a little bit, and I get my knee under it. And so then I, and I have it, right? And then I'm like, I'm like Josiah, get underneath, <laughs> right? And it's like, as soon as you say, I got this, things start to go wrong, right? It's like, get underneath and get your back under it, and then press. And, uh, and so, like, we were going, and I'm like, Ugh, and I'm like, ah, oh, it's not going to work. So I let it, he gets out, and I let it down, right? And I'm like, we can do this, and I go and get a two-by-four, right? And I'm like, we'll just put it on a two-by-four and kind of roll it up on top. So we put a two-by-four up there, and we get it on there, and I get one push on the two-by-four, and it snaps the two-by-four. This is how heavy it is, <laughs> right? Snaps it, like just Bam. And I'm like, okay, let's try this again, right? And so we get underneath it, and I pack, pack a little bit of snow and get it higher, and I get around it, and I'm trying, it's snowing outside, and Josiah and I are out there, and I'm like, come on, <laughs> like, push! And we get in, and I was like, this is not going to happen. I'm just, somebody's going to get hurt. So then we yell, Caleb, like, come out! And so eventually Caleb, and I got some help, right? I needed deliverance, or otherwise somebody was going to get hurt, probably me, after my son got smashed by, like, the 200-pound snowball, Right? But oftentimes when we think, I got this, we get ourselves in a situation where we quickly realize we don't got this. And sometimes you think, well, I can handle that. I can, that's not like, you know, I'm not really tempted by that thing. And you step into that thing and then pretty quickly you realize, I don't got this. I need a deliverer. See, we all need deliverers. First Peter says this, First Peter chapter 5. It says, be alert and of sober mind. You know, sober, sober mind is humility, right? When you got that snowball wrapped around, you're like, nope. Like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not happening. And in fact, I probably shouldn't even try because I realize I'm, I'm humble enough that I'm going to need some help. He says, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing this same kind of suffering. You're not alone. You're not alone in this thing. But this is a startling image for us that Satan acts like a lion looking to devour you. You think you got this. And Satan's like, that's exactly what I want you to think. That you've got this. Because as soon as you think you've got this, you step in the snare. And Satan devours us. So what is it we need to resist? Well, it's temptation. And temptation looks different for everyone, but generally it falls into these three categories that the Apostle John gave us, I briefly mentioned at the beginning, into these three categories. And uh, it says this in 1 John 2.16. For everything in the world, so John talks about the world like this, like, um, this sphere of, of evil. So it's not like that the creation here is this evil entity, but John has this idea um, of speaking about the world in, ter- in terms of the things that would... would uh, distract us or, or throw us off from the way of the kingdom. So this is how John understands this. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, right, but from the world. So he's essentially saying from, from Satan, or from this way, these ways that Satan tries to devour us. The tempter, right, it says the thief, the devil, the accuser, Satan, right, he tempts us within these areas. And out of these three areas is where we generally sin both towards God and towards other people. And this is from the very beginning, right? This, this, we can see it at creation in the Garden of Eden. These three things are there. So I want us to look real briefly at these things. So what is lust of the flesh? And we could probably figure this one out pretty quick. But it's the temptation to satisfy our cravings, whether they be physical, mental, um, emotional, in such a way that we reject our dependence on God, that we reject our dependence on God and use objects or humans to satisfy that appetite. We reject dependence on God and use objects or humans to satisfy a flesh appetite. It's taking good things and making them ultimate things, right? It's not that food is bad. It's not that sex is bad. But within, with outside of the boundaries that God has set for us, they become temptations that produce death in us. This is where the scriptures are clear and the scriptures help us in this if we're willing to be led in those areas. That if we're willing to allow God to define and refine those appetites that we have so they produce good in us. So he says the lust of the flesh. Then he says the lust of the eyes. And this is the temptation of discontent. This is undisciplined desire. 
Right? The Old Testament scriptures talk about it in terms of covetousness, right? So one of, the, one of the Ten Commandments is do not covet, not a word we use again, but it's simply wanting what isn't yours to have. Right? It's looking around and, and, and wanting all the things. It's, it's the idea of my eyes have a voracious appetite, right? Have your eyes ever been satisfied? Right? You look around and you see and you see and you see and you, you're never satisfied. This is the idea of the lust of the eyes, that we are never satisfied. And the third one is pride of life. And it's the temptation to think and act like you've got it all figured out. You don't, you don't need a deliverer. You are where you are because you made it happen. This, this pride of life is the rejection of dependence on God and others. That you need other people in your life. And you need God in your life. So how do we guard against temptation? I want to give you a couple things and we'll wrap it up. How do we guard against temptations? How do we stand firm, right? How do we resist the, the evil one? Um, how do we allow the good shepherd to lead us, the one who is praying for us? How do we begin to pray this prayer with integrity? And if we are in need of deliverance, which we all are, how do we partner with God in this effort? In other words, how do we grow in dependence when it comes to trials and temptations? Well, the bottom line really, I think, is this, and it's super simple, but when it comes to trials and temptations, don't try, train. Right, so often we think, well, I'm just going to try to do this thing, but you've never trained yourself to do that thing. And so you think you're going to be successful in that area. It's like, well, I'm just going to try, and then you fail because you don't have the discipline to train. Right? And when it comes to temptation, when it comes to the trials that we will face, right? not an if, but will, we have to train for those moments. And when it comes to these things, you, you need to give up trying. And with the Holy Spirit's help, you need to start training. And this is the hard thing about when it comes to temptation, really any area of your life. So this is applicable across the board for you. That so often we try to do something, but we don't really want to have the discipline to train to do something. So Romans 8, 26 says this, the spirit helps us in our weakness. Right, so as we train, as you realize, boy, I'm really weak at this thing, you've got a helper. Right? You've got a deliverer. That a person, Jesus, who is interceding on your behalf, the Spirit in you that is helping you in your weakness. So I want to give you, I want to give you three ways that you can partner with the Holy Spirit in training. Right? That, that you can stop trying and start training. And you're not going to be surprised really by any of these things. Right? So training is pretty simple. We just don't like to be disciplined. Right? <laughs> this is really the truth of it. Right? Training is pretty straightforward. And if we would actually do it, it would produce good things in us. And so here it is. is keep watch of your life. So moments before Jesus is going to be arrested and he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he's praying with a couple of his disciples and, uh, and he comes back to find his disciples snoozing, right? And they're sleeping and uh, he's not necessarily mad at them, but anytime anybody ever like you try to pray and you sleep, come on, like anybody, like none of you, just me, all right? So next point. Right? But, but he says, pray, and they sleep. And Jesus comes back, and in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, he says this, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into the temptation. Right? It's not that you would just like, oh, like I'm just, I'm going to fall into it. Like I just like, no, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I love how Jesus understands what I want to do in my spirit, but oftentimes my body fights against Right? He understands. He's like, the spirit is willing. I see that in you, but the flesh is weak. Right? I love this, that, that Jesus understands this. And I'm like, I'm sleepy. And Jesus is like, well, maybe you're lazy. But, you know, how do we combat this tension? Right? Watch and pray. Keep watch of your life. Well, what does that look like? You won't be surprised. Okay? It's like your trainer or your doctor telling you you need to drink more water. You're like, I, I know. Because right? we say this all the time. Right, so this is just what it is because it's true. So how do you, how do you watch and pray? Well, you, your first one is you pray. Right, That's why we do a series on prayer and you pray daily. Right, and I know this, is, this can be a challenge for some, but um, I mean, get your phone out, right? And set your alarm for nine, noon, and six, right? Sometimes for me, I set my timer for 15 minutes. I'm just like, God, I know I need to spend time with you, but I'm really distracted. And so I'm just gonna set my timer for 15 minutes. That helps me shut my brain off a little bit and pray. And be in God's presence. Maybe it's five minutes for you, but you find some time daily to pray. To allow this. And sometimes it's just silence. Right? It's just time before God. Other times you got things to say. That's all right. But spending time daily in prayer. The second one is this. Scripture. Daily. Right? You want to know how Jesus resisted Satan in the desert? 
right? Did he get out some rocks, right? He's like, eh, like hitting them with rocks, right? No, like, like did, he, did he call the angels down? No, he didn't, he didn't do that as well. Um, you know, what other strategies would he have? You know, did he form a bow staff, right? You know, out and nope, didn't do that. Jesus quoted scripture, right? He uses scripture to fend off Satan, and so often we think, you know, we, we get into this and we realize this maybe not work for us, but the psalmist says this in, in, in Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Right? There's power when we get into scriptures every day. And maybe you just need to get on your phone and download the Bible app. Right? And, and join a plan and start soaking your life in God's word every day. Don't get stuck on understanding. Sometimes we feel like we have to understand it all. No, like the Spirit works. Right? The Spirit is our helper. He helps us in our weakness. That if you just put yourself in God's Word every day, you're going to be strengthened because that's what the Spirit does. We have a deliverer. And so get yourself in God's Word every day. And if you need help with that, I'll help you. And we'll get you on a plan that works. Like You're like, I think I'm going to start in Leviticus. Don't do that. Right? Like We can help you find a place where you can feel like you're successful right, in the Scriptures. And one of the cool things about the Bible app is it'll read it to you. You're like, I don't like to read. Great, it'll read it to you. Right? You can get in your car and push play. Right? And it'll read the scriptures to you soaking in God's word every day. So prayer, scripture. Third one I think is the hardest one, and this is Sabbath. And we talk about this a lot. And I have to talk about it in terms of, to let you know, I struggle with, with this one. But there's a reason we find it in the scriptures. When are you most susceptible to temptation? When you're tired? Right, when you're frustrated, when you're hungry, right, when you're worn out. You see, those who refuse to slow down will eventually come crashing down. You will. You just will because you won't be strong enough. You won't be trained enough. You will be too tired to stand up against that temptation. And a regular Sabbath practice helps restore us, helps renew us, as well as clear the fog in our lives so that we can see clearly, well, what, what does that look like? Well, I think ideally it looks like 24 hours of rest, right, and reflection and restoration every week. That there's some sort of 24-hour block. And I know some of you are like, that's, not, that's impossible. I, believe me, I, I understand, right? This is, this is a weekly struggle. So maybe it starts as a six-hour block for you. Maybe it starts as a three-hour block that somehow and in some way you were finding ways to stop, to allow God to, to rest your body. Right, to allow your, let yourself to reflect a little bit in your mind. To say, God, where, what have I been doing and where have I been going? I need to reflect a little bit and to restore my soul. Right? David says, praise, says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. There's something about stopping. I think this is why it's actually one of the Ten Commandments. That we should not forsake the Sabbath. Because we need it. And I'd encourage you to find it. It's really hard, but start somewhere. Next one is this, Community. Right? Our lives were meant to be shared. And so the scripture says, lead us not into temptation. Right? It doesn't say lead me. Right? It says lead us. All throughout this Lord's Prayer, it's an us prayer. Right? And so it's lead us into temptation. So I'd encourage you, get into a group right, where you share your life. And sometimes this takes time. Sometimes you need to be in a group for, for several years before you feel like, wow, like, I feel like I can actually like, share my life and I just continue to come back to it. And maybe it's a class for you. Maybe it's a, 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 a group of you know, women or men that you've been gathering around for years. It doesn't have to be like a formal life group. But you've got a community of people that speak into your life and that you're allowed to be authentic and real with. This takes time. And I'd encourage you, if we can get you in a group, help you get in a space where you can begin to share your life or you don't journey alone, that as we say, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. You don't stand alone. The next one is guard your steps. Pretty similar um, to the first one. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians. If you think right, you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you think you're all that, right, if you think you got it together, guess what? You're right on the edge. Right? And all somebody needs to do is like, Kya! like, and off you go, right, off the cliff. Paul says, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. We have a deliverer. Proverbs 19.3 says this, a person's own folly leads to their ruin. All right? 
It's, it's their own folly. It's my own lack of paying attention. It's my own habits and hangups that lead to my ruin. And their heart then rages. Like, God, why did you do this to me? God, why do you keep bringing these temptations to me? Or we rage against God. And it's, it's our own folly that takes us there. See, we often talk about falling into temptation. But more often than not, the truth is we court temptation. Right? We court it by not guarding our steps. So you need to do whatever you have to do to keep yourself from situations that invite temptation. Right, don't be foolish. Don't be like the proverb, the, the fool who steps into folly because you think you got this. The last one is this, never trust your own strength. Right, we pray this prayer with integrity when we realize we must pray this prayer. We pray, lead us not and deliver us out of a recognition of weakness and humility, out of dependence. Right? Where God leads, God also delivers. And we pray with the Apostle Paul who says, when I am weak, then you are strong. I recognize I don't have what it takes and I need you. And this, the whole point of the Lord's prayer is to train us in dependence. Right? So we say, hallowed be your name. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debt. Right? Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. It's all about depending upon God in every situation in the reality of life. And so today, we come to communion. So we do communion together on the first Sunday of every month. And communion is an act of dependence. It's an act of saying, I need the blood of Jesus. I need, I need the sacrifice on the cross for me to remind me that I need a deliverer and that I can't resist temptation. I can't resist trials unless I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. And so we come to communion, we come with boldness and we, because we pray our Father, right, who through Christ's death and resurrection has given us freedom from sin and death, we can be victorious. Right? You don't have to fall into temptation, right? You can, you can be trained and persevere through trial because of what God has done. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive inside of you. You are not powerless to the trials and temptation, right? The Holy Spirit is our trainer. We just need to stop trying and start training. But we also come with weakness and humility. The recognition that apart from my dependence on the body and the blood of Christ, all I can do is try. Apart from my dependence on God and the sacrifice made by Jesus Christ, all I can do is try, and my trying has nothing compared to the powers that work in this world. I need dependence, and I need to be trained in the way of Jesus. God does not call us to try. God calls us to depend and to train to be victorious through the blood of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Kristen's going to come, and, and we're going to participate in communion this morning as a way to Confess our dependence on Jesus, that you can't do it on your own, and I can't do it on my own. And so Jesus calls us to the table. He calls us to the place where we recognize our dependence, that we need God's strength. And so as you're, as you're working on your, your communion this morning, getting that top, that top piece off, it can be a challenge. Um, I want to read to you from the scriptures out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says this, and he calls the church together. Because this was the regular habit of the early church. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember our dependence. That the body of Christ gives us life. Like literally the flesh sacrificed on the cross. And in the same way, after supper, he takes a cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26 says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I am dependent on you, God. Until one day you return and make everything right, I am, I am humbling myself and saying, I can't do this without you. I can try, but, but I know that I shouldn't be trying. I should be training and coming to the table to receive strength from your Holy Spirit, that you help us in our weakness, that you are my deliverer, that you intercede for me. And so I come out of desperation knowing I can't do it. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, I, I lean upon the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 27, so then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of our Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So we don't come to communion lightly. We recognize that we need a deliverer. 
And so I just want us to say this confession as we prepare to receive these elements. We do this pretty often here now. Just a simple couple of phrases. And let's do this together. So here we go. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Thanks be to God. So now, may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. Preserve you blameless under everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Now may the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful Would you take a drink. And I want to invite you to stand with me as, as we pray a prayer of benediction. God, we love you so much. We thank you, God, that we have one who leads us and we have one who delivers us. That in trials and in temptations, we are not alone. That your spirit helps us in our weakness. And Lord, as we received these elements this morning, we again confess that we can try all we want, but we know that we're not called to try. We're called to train by your power at work within us. And so, Lord, I pray for every person in this room and those online that maybe they struggle with prayer or scripture or Sabbath, God, or, or being in community, that you would strengthen them. Lord, that they would begin to, to discipline their lives in such a way that they train to be victorious. And God, in the midst of that, would you remind us that when we fail, we're still loved. Just as, as Peter, God, you called him and you said, when, when you turn back, strengthen the brothers. God, that you don't abandon us in our weakness. You join us there. And so we ask you to lead us. And Lord, I pray for the spirit of Christ the Prince of Peace, to be upon your people. I pray that as they go throughout this week in the realities of this world, that you would strengthen them by, their, by your spirit and that they would know they are not alone. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Church, I wanna thank you for worshiping with us today. We're gonna get you out of here. I encourage you to join us at prayer, right? Six noon and, or nine noon and 6 p.m. And I say this every week, but you can only fail at prayer when you don't pray. So I'd encourage you to pray this week and join God's spirit as he works in you. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.